Here we are. The, uh, the, the, the topic of the next 20 minutes that we'll spend together is, in fact, the theme, the subtitle of this year's fantastic Games Beat conference itself. Um, and only a short time ago, that proposition would have been uh, speculative, shall we say. Let's see. Uh-oh. We're going to have to move into next slide <laughs> mode. Clicker's not working. Oh, and now it's gone too far. Great, so this slide uh, makes it so that, uh, that my PR and marketing people don't have to re-educate me when I get back. Um, this was the original title of the talk. I think it's always good to keep old drafts. Actually, the original, original uh, version of the title had uh, the initials PK uh, replaced with the word electric, but that put Microsoft in rather an awkward position, and so we migrated to the version that you saw initially. But the question about whether, uh, whether there is a feedback cycle, feedback loop, among speculative fiction, among games, and among real world technology is something where 10 years ago you could have gotten away saying, well, you know, the, uh, the flip phones from Motorola are really based on the Star Trek communicator. But you know that, right? So the question now isn't whether there's a feedback loop. There is. Uh, and technology does very explicitly and consciously and volitionally take cues from science fiction, from movies, from games, from cinema. Uh, the question in really now is what to make of it. Uh, is it worthwhile? And I'm going to attempt here to, uh, to persuade you that it is. Uh, and rather than try to make a, a grand thesis about that whole thing, instead what I want to do is suggest, uh, is to show you a trajectory, a single trajectory that actually spans a great number of years, almost 40 years. Uh, and so through that very, very specific trajectory, give you a sense, I hope, uh, of what might be possible generally, this certain kind of longevity proposition to the whole thing. So we're going to watch a set of ideas swing back and forth twice, like a pendulum, from the uh, fictional world into the real world, and we might even get a fraction of a, a final swing toward the end. So step zero is something I've never talked about publicly before, um, mainly because it's not mine to talk about, but it was an enormous inspiration to me in the very earliest days. There's an artist and technologist whom maybe some of you know called Michael Neymark, and he had an amazing installation, art piece, technology demonstration in 1980 called Displacements. And it went like this. So he built a set of a living room, furnished it with all sorts of living room type objects, had a bunch of actors wander through it uh, and you know, engage in simple interactions uh, with the physical objects there. But in the center of the room, he'd set up a camera a film camera, of course, uh, that was on a motorized head mounted at the nodal point of the lens that slowly rotated around the room and captured what was going on in the room. This is, by the way, one of those amazing pieces that has the incredible property that it's as beautiful to describe and understand as a, as a raw set of ideas uh, as it is to see the result. Uh, what happened then is that he spray painted the entire set white. All of the props, the fruit on the table, the globes, the pictures on the walls, the sofa, the cushions, the pillows, the rest of it. This picture, by the way, was taken by Scott Fisher, who is uh, one of the fathers of the second go-around of VR. And I love being at a conference where I don't actually have to try to convince anyone that we're now on the third go-around of VR. History is important. So now you've got this white painted set, uh, and then he replaced the camera, the motion picture camera that had been on the tripod in the center of the room with a projector. Uh, the, uh, the, the entire setup was synchronized to the original position and rotational speed of the camera. And what happens as a result is that you reproject this moving rectangle of life onto an otherwise sterile uh, set. Uh, and in a sense, it's, uh, it's some of the world's first augmented reality and without any headgear. This is just very sort of handheld video that documents that process. But this is something that's so, so, uh, so simple uh, and yet executed with such precision that it's, uh, it's really elusive and it had a huge effect on me uh, even hearing about it the first time. And so what this suggested to me was that we could uh, take the next step forward, move from analog to digital, and instead of displacing the camera and the projector in time, Instead, put them together in both time and space. That's really nice. Uh, and you'd end up with a new structure. And so this is the next step, uh, a system called the IO bulb. And the idea here is that we're going to replace the world's supply of light bulbs with these new kinds of high-resolution light bulbs that have both a projector and a camera inside them. 
And in so doing, we're going to bite down on reality. We're going to look out into reality, try to understand what's going on there, uh, and then project information and interaction where it might be uh, useful to do so. Uh, and if you do that with all of the light bulbs in, uh, in an architectural space, you get a thing called the luminous room. So here are a series of experiments. This is about uh, 1995, 1996. Uh, and what you'll notice right away is that all of the appurtenances of the modern UI are kind of gone here. So we don't have rectangular windows. We don't have scroll bars and pull down menus and the rest of it. We've just got pixels and information where, in this case, we deem it reasonable and useful to have it. So with this simple motion, we're going to enact digital storage in a physical container. The contract is the same as with real world objects in a physical container. It's location independent, uh, location invariant. The same stuff comes out no matter where you move it in the room. Uh, and the room knew a whole, bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of disparate little tricks, including how to play chess if you presented it with a sticky backed chess board that for some reason you'd brought with you to work that day, uh, and so on. Uh, and so the proposition that we could take the computer out of the computer, smash open the display, let the pixels go everywhere, let the pixels follow around the person, uh, had really interesting consequences. So this is a standard CAD-style interaction, an optics prototyping workbench, uh, but without an optics prototyping workbench CAD UI, where you've got physical handles that represent lasers and mirrors and beam splitters and stuff like that that give you access to the simulation. Same idea here, even more simply, uh, a physical shape that you've cut out from some paper or that you bend into a desired form is now the input into a fluid flow simulation. The fluid flow simulation is not new, but what's new is the kind of intuition that you can get when you extend the causality that you understand from being an expert user of the physical world into the digital realm, and you, you sort of eradicate that formerly very thick membrane between the real and the physical. This was a, an architecture and urban planning simulation that uh, sort of took the thing to its, its full measure of complexity and sophistication. Um, we'll skip ahead, uh, because it was this work that eventually caught the eye of what was then a nascent production, the film Minority Report. We'll never be free of it. We're always going to have to talk about Minority Report whenever we talk about the future. I've come to terms with that, um, and uh, since that blessing and curse is attached to, uh, to some of this eager correspondence work, let's take a look at it. But what I do want to do today is reinterpret it a little bit. Uh, Minority Report became, in a strange way, uh, not only the poster child for this idea of an interplay between technology uh, and speculative fiction, but it became actually kind of a... Uh, a, a shopping spree for people looking to start new companies. Uh, I think it partly historically it has to do with the fact that uh, between the time we made the movie and it was released, 9-11 had occurred and so it suddenly became really exciting to get rid of all of our civil and civic freedoms and be surveilled and stuff like that which the film had looked at and suddenly we found ourselves in the position of people coming to us and saying, wow, uh, predictive crime prevention and uh, non-lethal weapons that make you throw up. These are all great ideas. Let's start companies. And we were sort of going, well, it was supposed to be uh, a cautionary tale. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but there you have it. That's how the world works. Um, part of the, but the other part of the reason that, this, that this, uh, this small container, because that's what a film is, it's really a very small container for ideas, worked so well in this mode is because of this man, Alex McDowell, the film's production designer, uh, and in very, one of the very first sessions today, the idea of world building um, was nominated, and indeed, Alex is kind of the, the standard bearer for world building, and in fact, he was hired as the production designer on the film the same day the writer was hired. So there was no script, there was no story, there was the barest skeleton of the Philip K. Dick short story, which resembles the final film almost not at all, uh, and Alex knew that the only way to pull this thing off, because Spielberg's cameras might have to go anywhere. Are we going to go into a hospital? What does the hospital look like? Will we have to go into a subway? Are we going to be in the courtroom? No, the courtroom scene got shelved. Instead, we're in a supermarket. The only way to be able to shoot this film, Alex knew, was to design all of it, design the entire world so that no matter where the story needed to go, there would be a world to back it up. Uh, that plus uh, Spielberg's cachet, obviously, uh, to some extent, his, uh, his capital, uh, and, uh, and Alex's dedication to this idea of verisimil verisimilitude meant that the world we ended up designing um, was, was sort of knitted together better in, in some sense 
than most other science fiction films set in the future because the process was simply to extrapolate forward from existing, you know, uh, 20, 2002 at that time, 2001, uh, US of A, uh, and to take technologies that were then just emerging and extrapolate them 50 years to show what Washington DC would look like in 2054. And so we had to know everything. We had to both invent, extrapolate, and integrate technologies for uh, personal information, transportation, uh, ecological stuff, uh, flying cars. That doesn't look too promising anytime in the future. We had to explain, if not excuse, the fact that there are psychic children floating in milky baths predicting violent crime all day long through their dreams, which is a little unfortunate if you think about it, and a hundred times more than that, right? Again, a film is a small container. Not everything you think up fits into the film. Uh, these are paparazzi bots that fly around, uh, just like regular paparazzi, uh, but with wings, I guess, and jostle physically with each other for visual access to crime scenes and sporting events and so forth. Uh, and so all that was collected together into the uh, 2080 Bible, so-called, originally. Then we got downgraded to 2044, because who could possibly predict 80 years ahead? Then we got upgraded to 2054 for reasons that no one remembers, but if you watch really carefully, you can see uh, 10 years being put into the calendar math that comes out of the actors' uh, heads. Uh, and among all of that, there was one problem that was more difficult than all the rest, which was that Spielberg wanted to know what computers would look like and how we would operate them. 10 years, 20 years, 50 years in the future. And he said, please don't tell me it's going to be the keyboard and the mouse still. Uh, and so they were really excited when they had seen, when they saw the IO bulb and luminous room work from the MIT Media Lab, because it seemed that this much more direct, physically mediated system that would let people use their hands uh, might just be the ticket to, uh, to come up with a UI, a, a new kind of information system that was um, both more capable, that was an important idea, because these sort of uh, super cops needed to be able to use it to get more done. And also, obviously, more cinematic. There's uh, nothing more difficult than being in charge of a film where someone's hacking, hack, 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 which is like this. You can only have people's faces light up or have characters projected on them for so long. So all of those were desirable characteristics. I have to stand back here for the clicker to work. You'll forgive me. Um, I ended up writing, uh, making sort of thesauruses, thesauri dictionaries. Uh, that stood as training manuals for the characters, for the actors to learn how to use this new system. Uh, and because I was uh, very naive, I had no idea how films worked, the only way I knew how to prepare for this was as if we'd have to really build it, as if we would have to make this stuff work in the real world, which turned out to be a very useful exercise indeed. Uh, and of course, this being a moving medium, uh, we also went so far as to make training films, and this is an important idea. Uh, the tools of production, the tools of film production and animation were just then becoming cheap enough, readily available enough that you could do this just as one person drinking a lot of coffee, sleeping on a friend's couch in about 10 weeks. So you could show the producers and the director and the actors what it would look like in very rough form once they'd learned this gestural language, once they were applying it, uh, and what would come out on the other end. And that was a big light bulb moment for the entire production. The director knew that he wouldn't have to apologize for these scenes, as had happened before and happened afterwards in other films that we won't name, uh, that involved gestural interfaces, but that instead the narrative could hang on it. He could tell a little piece of the story through this UI. We could reveal information, uh, and we wouldn't have to whip, pan, or cut away in embarrassment. That was the hope anyway. Uh, and so what ended up happening was uh, that we rehearsed for weeks and weeks and weeks with the actors. Uh, each scene was sort of briefly discussed so that the actors knew what they were supposed to be doing, what they were going to see on the big screen, because of course all that would get composited later. But they knew what it was. They knew how this interface worked. And they were, in some very, very nearly real sense, the first users of this new kind of interface. Uh, and what came out the other end is, uh, is something. Next slide, please. Are there more clickers in the house? OK, great. Nope. Uh, what came out the other end is something that we don't even need to watch. Next slide, please. And one more after that, because we saw it in better resolution uh, in the video that set up the whole thing. And it's become very, fam very familiar indeed. 
following that, uh, it seemed like there was one more really important step, um, which was that in a strange sense, we'd managed to hijack the Hollywood machine to create what might stand as the world's largest user focus group test. We'd put a new UI, a new information system in front of tens, maybe hundreds of millions of human eyes and asked implicitly the question, is there something you'd like to use? Is there something of value here? Uh, and, and the response was kind of excitingly overwhelming. And it seemed like now was the time, then was the time, to really put it into practice, to take this idea that had been prototyped in academia and in art pieces and in this fictional setting and bring it into commercial reality where it could be used to get work done. Uh, and so Oblong Industries is the company that results from that. Uh, there are a couple of principles here that we're going to swing through really, really quickly that all derive from the earlier work, uh, but that gain a new currency and a new depth and a new solidity uh, once you have to build them for real. So human hands are really, really important. Human pointing is kind of a magical gesture. We do it socially for the benefit of other people. It connects your body to distant objects, but you do it so that other people know what you're pointing at, and it works like a charm. Uh, and now we can teach the machine that same bit of magic geometry. What are you pointing at? And all of a sudden then, you've got action at a distance, which is very, very powerful indeed. Sometimes it's gesture that happens in free space. Sometimes it's hovering as here uh, near a surface. Sometimes it turns into touch, where the constraints uh, of, and the advantages of friction really uh, come to the fore. Sometimes you can reach out and grab objects, whether they're abstract uh, or uh, or real and representational and have them do something useful. Sometimes the pixels are physical objects, but they have to submit to the same control language and so forth. Navigation turns out to be one of the most important things that you get as a benefit. Uh, we've got 20, 25 years of really fantastic computer-aided visualization, but even when it's animated, it's only lighting up half of the human brain. If we could put your head inside an fMRI machine, I think that would be borne out. No one's volunteered for that task yet. Um, but if it's input only, you're not, uh, you're not understanding as much as you might. Whereas if you can fly through a space and see the stuff change, then you're wiring the entire brain that understands what happens when you walk through a landscape and watch the horizon change and the rest of that. Uh, so letting human hands do what human hands do. More slides, please. There we go. Um, spatial computing is, uh, is the next idea. If we're going to have these large extended spaces uh, of available pixels, they can no longer, logically, they can no longer stop at the boundaries of a device. It's a weird liability of the way we've been building computers for the last 35 years that each device has a UI that's attached to its screen and that goes no further which made sense in the beginning, but now they all have networks, so it doesn't make sense anymore, except we're accustomed to it. We're acculturated to the idea that the UI, the interactivity, and therefore the efficacy of this thing stops at the edge. And the UI is built to make that be the case. You can't get the, the mouse off the edge uh, of the display. But what if you could? What if every time you wrote a program or ran a program or interacted with the system, you had the understanding that uh, it could go anywhere? So here's a little bit of media that's running around five different screens, being driven by three different computers, running two different operating systems, and it's all continuous in space and time. And to just geek out severely for a moment, this is about 50 lines of code written in Oblong's uh, toolkit called G-Speak, and zero lines of that code are dedicated to the idea that the pixels might have to be supported by more than one machine, more than one GPU, uh, more than one screen. And so that's exciting. So you should get used to the idea as a user, as a programmer, that boundarylessness is the thing that, uh, that you have at your beck and call, which is the way the physical world works as well. We can skip past this one, please. If there's a Pavlovian thing, I have to keep pressing this, even though I know it's not doing anything. It's fun at the elevator, too. Uh, all right, so to, to dive back into the world of cinema, next slide, please. Uh, there's something that I think we can aspire to, which is the idea that a UI doesn't have to be dry. A UI, if it's properly done, should be literally exhilarating, the same way that skydiving or swimming or singing or laughing is. Uh, and so to substantiate that proposition, we built this, a system that kind of makes cinema swallow its own tail, that takes a 120-year-old language of cinema and makes it input as well as output. And you get to navigate around a panoply of about 24 films in space and time, and then disassemble individual scenes, pull props and actors and landscapes, uh, and bits of architecture out of scenes, put them down on the composing table, 
and then go next door to a movie that was made at a different time, in a different country, on different topics, commit cinematic heresy, and assemble something absolutely new out of pieces that were definitely not designed to go together. Uh, but as much as this is maybe a look at the future of editing, uh, it's more than that for us at Oblong, a kind of metaphor, a metaphor for how, uh, how powerful you should be with regard to your own digital stuff, your own data. Not powerful in a brute sense, uh, but powerful in terms of sophistication. You should have this level of efficacy with all the stuff that's yours. Uh, two more little principles, and I'll go fast. Uh, the other is, the next one is another liability of this trend, the trend from desktop machines to laptop machines to tablets to smartphones, which is that the stuff is getting smaller. Now, we're not proposing that you give this up. The great thing is that computation now comes with you. But this is a new idea, and yet it shouldn't be new. I don't understand why I don't hear anyone talking about it, but I would like to propose that normal human work, human workflows, human activity, human problems, problem solutions, all have an innate scale. Some things are small, like a shopping list or an, a game that you play to while away the hour. On the other hand, you wouldn't uh, plan a tricky neurological surgery on this, not because it's not capable, the CPU is probably good enough, but just because it's not big enough. You can't see enough. You can't interact with enough. So sometimes you need bigger spaces to support the work, the cognition, and the interaction that you have in mind. Uh, and these are a series of sketches, all taking about a day or two to write and play with, that try to bear out that hypothesis. So if you're an urban planner and you need to understand what's going to happen to your city when the president visits and traffic is completely bollocked up for the bunch of days, you probably want to see it at Vista scale, not at 3 by 5 card scale. Uh, and experiments in medical imaging like that, financial data, uh, the rest of it that suggests that there are different ways to understand. Cognition happens at different scales. Uh, and so you shouldn't be afraid to, uh, to assert that certain problems need something that's closer to a room than to a phone. And finally, the last principle um, is one that I, that I think is what really invites reinterpretation of those minority report scenes, um, which are mostly written about and talked about as being a depiction of a gestural interface, and that's true, but I think that's not the biggest value that's being shown there. What's being shown is that there's a UI in this fictional setting that allows really, really superbly talented teams to work together on really hard problems under incredible time circumstances. They've got six minutes to find the killer, otherwise the murder happens. Uh, and so the, that's a collaborative UI in the movie. Uh, and this is something where uh, Uniquely, uh, video games have uh, the upper hand. Actually, video games UIs have the upper hand in all sorts of ways, but it's the first one that I would nominate. Games are the only place where people build collaborative UIs. The idea that more than one person might have to use a computer at the same time. And yet that happens all day long and very, very beautifully in the games world. But it's shocking to someone who builds, uh, builds interaction on any other system. And we need to take a big, big page out of the game's book. In fact, every computational experience should be collaborative from here on out. You should assume that that's the case rather than the exception. So this, uh, where you saw a bunch of experiments and prototypes uh, from the, over the years at Oblong, this is um, one of our products. This is Mezzanine, uh, and where every computer that you've ever used is a, a solipsistic one-person-at-a-time computer, this is a complement to it. Not a replacement, but a complement. This is a computer that multiple people use at the same time. It's a sort of Switzerland for pixels. The pixels belong to everyone. I'm not saying that Switzerland belongs to everyone. I'm just saying that it's neutral. Uh, the pixels are neutral, and people can inject content in parallel, just the same way you use the physical world. Nothing about physics, nothing about the universe stops three of us from going up to a whiteboard and drawing at the same time. It's just that every program you've ever used, except in a game UI, asserts that you have to do one thing at a time, serial, not parallel. So I think what I'm trying to get at here is that not only is there real value in the kind of transmission of ideas back and forth from speculative fiction uh, and games and so forth into technology, real world stuff and back, uh, but that it actually is so rich and so promising that it bears a kind of sustained inspection, a sustained effort. Uh, and that if you find themes that are well treated by both, stuff, stuff you want to get done in the tech world, and stuff that's interesting in, uh, in the speculative fiction world, you can find a thread that goes for, in this case, uh, 40, almost 40 years and counting. 
Um, so I'm going to go through a bunch of these really, really quickly. But these are alternate talks titles. Um, once we've sort of accepted everything that's happened so far as a basis and as some sort of simulacrum of truth. Um, interestingly, tool sets are convergent. Depending on what you're working on, you can use the same tool sets, the same prototyping tools, the same animation and CG capabilities that you do in the production of games and movies and animations to prototype real world tech and UI experiences. That's worth some thinking. Um, we won't go into Minority Report versus Iron Man, but we can do that out there afterwards. Now it gets more interesting. Uh, Henry Jenkins said uh, that it's his belief that nothing has so held back the development of games as a medium as that weird drive to photorealism. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if I agree with him all the way, but there's something to be said for non-representational stuff. So a few of you are old enough, like me, to remember the game Tempest, um, which sort of has a through line that ends up um, at Rez and some other places. Tempest is a game and a narrative of pure geometry. There's nothing anthropomorphic about anything that happens in that game, and yet it's more than enough story. Uh, and if you look at uh, the kind of parallel history of experimental seri uh, cinema, Paul Sharrett, uh, Tony Conrad, Hollis Frampton, these are pioneers who've done with cinema what I think we need to do um, in the games world and in the UI world both, to try something that doesn't necessarily try to hang on a literal narrative, because there's a whole parallel universe there that's super exciting. Um, after a, uh, a morning discussion with Elliot Pepper, whom you'll hear from tomorrow, I felt compelled to put this in. So this is about squaring what we have now. Uh, those of you who remember seeing John Malkovich, being John Malkovich for the first time, uh, there was an amazing moment in there where the 120-year-old history of cinema kind of swallowed itself. And that's where Malkovich goes into, through the portal into his own head. And that's the first time I could remember in like 25 or 30 years thinking, I've not seen this before, and I don't know what's going to happen. And so I'm really, really interested in what happens when media, when forms, when formats swallow themselves and square themselves. And I think Rick and Morty, I don't know if Justin's here uh, today or not, uh, or Dan Harmon, but I think Rick and Morty is getting close to it. Rick and Morty has swallowed the entire history of 20th century science fiction and is building something new out of it. So season three ought to be interesting. Uh, and so that's it. Uh, there's one more video, but I think we're out of time. Uh, I think that, uh, that the next swing, well, you know what? I'm going to revise something. I'm going to revise the old saw that we've heard already that says that any sufficiently advanced technology, blah, blah, blah. How about, since we don't really believe in magic, how about any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from sci-fi? And sci-fi is kind of where we ought to be living. Thanks. <laughs>